Hello, this is Eloisa James. Paris in Love is the story of the year in which my husband and I ran away. We sold our house and cars, uprooted the kids, and moved to Paris. Here is a little excerpt from our adventures, from the audiobook read by me. The Eiffel Tower One October day, we picked up Anna and her new friend Erica after school and walked to the Eiffel Tower. The girls ran ahead, zooming here and there like drunk fighter pilots showing off. Alessandra and I tried to imagine why the French ever planned to demolish the tower after the 1889 World Fair. It's such a beautiful, sturdy accomplishment. Destroying it would be like painting over the Mona Lisa because of her long nose. Smallish bateau mouche or tourist boats, more in the Seine, near the foot of the tower, or so my guidebook said. We wandered beneath the lacework iron, the girls skittering and shrieking like seagulls. Down by the water, we paid for the cheaper tickets, the kind that come without crepes and champagne. With 20 minutes to wait, we retreated to an ancient carousel next to the river. A plump woman sat huddled in her little ticket box, shielded from tourists and the rain, although as yet, neither had appeared. Anna and Erica clambered aboard, but still the operator waited, apparently hoping that two children astride would somehow attract more. The girls sat tensely on their garish horses, their skinny legs a little too long. At 10 years old, they'll soon find themselves too dignified for such childish amusements, but not yet. Finally, the music started and the horses jerked forward. A crowded merry-go-round on a sunny day is a blur of children's grins and bouncing bottoms. But as the girls disappeared from view, leaving us to watch riderless horses jolt up and down, I realized that an empty merry-go-round on a cloudy day loses that frantic gaiety, the sense that the horses dash towards some joyful finish line. These horses could have been objets trouvés, discovered on a dust heap and pressed into service. The steed behind Anna's was missing the lower half of his front leg. They arched their necks like chargers, crossing the Alps on some military crusade, battle-scarred and mournful. Every chip of gold paint, dented by a child's heels, stood out, stark and clear. With nowhere to go and nothing better to do, the operator let the girls go around and around. Finally, though, the music slowed, the last few notes falling disjointedly into the air. I decided that there's nothing more melancholy than a French carousel on a rainy day and wished we had paid for champagne and crepes. My favorite of Paris's many bridges is Pont Alexandre III, and my favorite of its many statues is not one of those covered with gold, but rather a laughing boy holding a trident and riding a fish. Although just a child, he's bigger than I am, his huge toes flying off the fish as he twists in midair. But he's a boy still with a guileless smile, caught in a moment when he is big enough to ride the back of a fish, but not yet acquainted with the world's sorrows and deceits. On the far end of Pont Alexandre Trois, opposite the merboy, sits his twin sister. She seems to have just left the water, She holds fronds of seaweed in one hand, and in the other a large seashell to her ear. Her face is intent as she looks into the distance, listening carefully. I imagine that she is listening for the rushing sounds of waves, the sound of home.